Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The budget the Chancellor has just delivered is actually the culmination of six years of his failures. It's a budget. Look, this corner is not some kind of foreground attraction. We expect the courtesy to both sides who ever speak. I want to hear him, and as I said before, I know that the public in this country wants to hear what the opposition has got to say as well. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's a recovery built on sand on a budget of failure. It's failed on the budget deficit, failed on debt, failed on investment, failed on productivity, failed on trade deficit, failed on the welfare cap, failed to tackle inequality in this country. And today, and today, Mr Deputy Speaker, he's announced growth is revised down last year, this year, every year is forecast. Business investment revised down, government investment revised down. It's a very good thing that the Chancellor is blaming the last government. He was the Chancellor in the last government. This budget, Mr Deputy Speaker, has unfairness at its very core paid for by those who can least afford it. He could not have made his priorities clearer. While half a million people with disabilities are losing over a billion pounds in, permanent, in personal independence payments, corporation tax is being cut and billions handed out in tax cuts to the very wealthy. The Chancellor, the Chancellor has said to, has, has to be judged on his record and by the tests he set himself. Six years ago, he promised a balanced structural current budget by 2015. It is now 2016. There is still no balanced budget. In 2010, he and the Prime Minister claimed we're all in it together. The Chancellor promised his House that the richest would pay more than the poorest, not just in terms of cash, but as a proportion of income as well. So let me tell him how that's turned out. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, independent organisation, found that, and I quote, the poorest have suffered the greatest proportionate losses. The Prime Minister told us recently he was delivering a strong economy and a sound plan. But strong for who? Strong to support who? Sound for who? when 80% of the public spending cuts have fallen on women in our society. This budget could have been a chance to demonstrate a real commitment to fairness and equality. Yet again, the Chancellor has failed. Five years ago, and it was great words, he promised a Britain carried aloft by the march of the makers. Soaring rhetoric. Mr Deputy Speaker, Despite the resilience, ingenuity and hard work of manufacturers, the manufacturing sector is now smaller than it was eight years ago. Last year, he told the Conservative conference, we are the builders. But ever since then, the construction industry has been stagnating. This is the record of a Conservative Chancellor who's failed to balance the books failed to balance out the pain, failed to rebalance our economy. It's no wonder that, Mr Deputy Speaker, that his close friend, the Honourable Member, member for Chingford and Wood Green is, uh, Woodford Green is complaining. And I quote, we were told for the next seven years things were looking great. Within one month of that forecast, we're now being told things are difficult. The gulf between what the Conservative Government expects from the wealthiest and what it demands from ordinary British taxpayers could not be greater. The mates rates deals for big corporations on tax deals is something they will be forever remembered for. This is a Chancellor who has produced a budget for hedge fund managers more than for small businesses. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a government... Oh. Mr Williams, sir, I don't know what it is that you always want to catch my attention. Can I assure you? You've got my attention. Let's not get it again. <laughs> <laughs>
opposition. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is a government that stood by as the steel industry bled. Skills, output, and thousands of very skilled jobs have been lost and communities ruined and damaged by the inaction of the government. The Chancellor set himself a one trillion export target. It's going to be missed by a lot more than a country mile. Instead of trade fueling growth as he promised, it is now holding back growth. He talked of the Northern Powerhouse and we now discover that 97% of the senior staff of the Northern Powerhouse have indeed been outsourced to London, to the South. And for all his talk, for all his talk of the Northern Powerhouse, the North East accounts for less than 1% of government's infrastructure pipeline projects in construction. For all his rhetoric, there has been systematic underinvestment in the North. Mr Deputy Speaker, across the country, local authorities, councils are facing massive problems a 79% cut in their funding. Every library that's been closed, every elderly person left without proper care, every swimming pool with reduced opening hours or closed altogether is a direct result of government underfunding our local authorities and councils. Far from presiding over good quality employment, he is the Chancellor that's presided over underemployment and insecurity. With nearly, with, with nearly, there are certain people that's testing my patience. So just think what your constituents are thi thinking out there as well. I want to hear the Leader of Opposition. I expect you to hear the Leader of Opposition. If you don't want to, I'm sure the tea room awaits. Maybe there's a phone call for Mr Horry if you keep shouting. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Security comes from knowing where your income is and knowing where your job is. If you're one of those nearly... If you're one of those nearly million people on a zero hours contract, you don't know what your income is. You don't have that security. We have the highest levels, Mr Deputy Speaker, of in-work poverty on record. The largest number without security. They need regular wages that can end poverty and can bring about real security in their lives. Logically, Mr Deputy Speaker, low paid jobs don't bring in the tax revenues that the Chancellor tells us he needs to balance his books. Household borrowing is once again being relied upon to drive growth. Risky, unsecured lending is growing at its fastest rate for the last eight years and is clearly not sustainable. The renewables industry is vital to the future of our economy, our planet, indeed our whole existence. It's been targeted for cuts. Thousands of jobs lost in the solar panel production industry and the Prime Minister, as we discussed earlier at Prime Minister's Question Time, promised the greenest government ever. Here again, an abject failure. Science spending also down a billion compared to 2010. Home ownership down under this Conservative government, a whole generation locked out of any prospect of owning their own home. And this is the Chancellor who believes that a starter home costing £450,000 is affordable. It might be for some of his friends, it might be for some members opposite, it isn't for those people who are trying to save for a deposit because they can't get any other kind of house. We heard promises, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, before. Two years ago, the Chancellor pledged a garden city of 15,000 homes in Ebbsfleet, and many cheered that. His ministers have been very busy ever since then. They've made 30 Ebbsfleet announcements, and they've managed to build 368 homes in Ebbsfleet. It's 12 homes for every press release. We need, we need obviously, 
a vast increase in press releases in order to get any homes built in Ebbsfleet or indeed anywhere else. And whilst we welcome the money that's going to be put forward to tackle homelessness, it is the product of underinvestment, underfunding of local authorities, not building enough council housing, not regulating the private rented sector that has led to this crisis. We need to tackle the issue of homelessness by saying that everybody in our society deserves a safe roof over their head. Yeah. Mr Speaker, child poverty is forecast to rise every year in this Parliament. What a damning indictment of this Government. And what a contrast to the last Labour Government that managed to lift almost a million children out of poverty. 81% of the tax increases and benefit cuts are falling on women and the 19% gender pay gap persists. Despite the protestations of the Chancellor, it is a serious indictment that women are generally paid less than men for doing broadly similar work. It re will require a Labour government to address this. To address this. And the government's own Social Mobility Commissioner said, and I quote, there is a growing sense that Britain's best days are behind us rather than ahead of us, as the next generation expects to be worse off than the last. The, the Chancellor might have said a great deal about young people. He failed to say anything about the debt levels that so many former students have, the high rents that young people have to pay, the lower levels of wages that young people get, the sense of injustice and insecurity that so many young people in this country face and feel every day. It will again require a Labour government to harness the enthusiasm and talent and energy of the young people of this country. Mr Deputy Speaker, Investing in public services is vital to people's well-being. I think we're all agreed on that, at least I hope we are. Yet every time the Chancellor fails, he cuts services, cuts jobs, sells assets, further privatises. That was very clear when we were looking at the effects of the floods last year. Flood defences were cut by 27%. People's homes in Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cumbria ruined because of his government's neglect of river basin management and the flood defences that are so necessary. Obviously, we welcome any money that is now going into flood defences. But, but, Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope that money will also be accompanied by reversing the cuts in the fire service, which makes it so difficult for our brilliant firefighters to protect people in their homes. Reverse the cuts in the Environment Agency, which makes it so hard for those brilliant engineers to protect our towns and cities, and for local government workers who performed so brilliantly during the crisis of December and January in the areas that were flooded. Our education service, Mr Deputy Speaker, invests in people. It's a vital motor for the wealth of this country in the future. So I ask, why have we seen a 35% drop in the adult skills budget by this government? People surely need the opportunity to learn, not have to go into debt in order to develop skills from which we, as a community, entirely benefit. The Chancellor announced yesterday, um, and there is not one shred of evidence to suggest that turning schools into academies boosts performance. There's nothing in the budget that deals with the real issue, which is teacher shortage, school place crisis, or ballooning class sizes. He uh, spoke at some length on the issue of um, ill health 
amongst young children and the way in which sugar is consumed at such grotesque levels within our society. And I agree with him about that. I welcome what he said. I'm sure he will join with me in welcoming the work done by many members of this House, including my friend the Member for Leicester East and his work, and Jamie Oliver in his work, in helping to deal with the dreadful situation of children's health. If we as a society cannot protect our children from high levels of sugar and all that goes with it with the later crisis of health, cancer and diabetes, then as a House we failed the nation. I support his proposals on sugar as I hope all members of this House will. But there is an issue that faces the National Health Service. The deficit has widened to its highest level ever on record. Waiting times are up. The NHS is in a critical condition. Hospital after hospital faces serious financial problems and is working out what to sell in order to balance its books. Our NHS should have the resources to concentrate on the health needs of the people, not having to get rid of resources in order to survive. The Public Accounts Committee reported only yesterday that National Health Service finances have deteriorated at a severe and rapid pace. I didn't detect much in this budget that's going to do much to resolve that crisis. He's also cut public health budgets, mental health budgets and adult social care. Earlier this month, the government forced through a £30 per week cut to disabled ESA claimants. Order. I'm summoned here because of the front bench conversations. If you need that conversation, I'm sure there's plenty of room in the tea room for it. Jeremy Cobbett. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Last week we learned that half a million people will lose up to £150 per week due to cuts in personal independence payments. I simply ask the Chancellor this. If he can finance the giveaways that he's put in his budget to different sectors, why can't he fund the need for dignity for the disabled people of this country? <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Chancellor said in the autumn statement that he had protected police budgets. Sir Andrew Dilnot confirms there has been a decrease in the police grant and 18,000 police officers have lost their jobs, fewer police on the streets, and as my friend the member for Brent South pointed out in her question to the Prime Minister, to cut down on dangerous crime against vulnerable individuals, we need community policing and we need community police officers. 18,000 losing their jobs doesn't help. This is a government with failure on the police, failure on the National Health Service, failure on social care, housing and education. Public investment lays the foundations for future growth. The OECD recognises that, the IMF, the G20. The CBI and the TUC are crying out for more infrastructure investment. It's Labour who will invest in the future in a high technology, high skill, high wage economy. The investment commitments the Chancellor made today, yes, of course they're welcome, but they're related and they're nowhere near the scale this country needs. People rightly fear that this is just another press release on the road to non-delivery of crucial projects. Chronic underinvestment presided over by this Chancellor, both private and public, means that the productivity gap between that Britain and the rest of the G7 is the widest it's been for a generation. Without productivity growth, revised down further today, we cannot hope to improve living standards. Our party, the Labour Party, backs a strategic state that understands businesses, public services, innovators and workers combine together to create wealth and drive sustainable growth. The Chancellor adopted a counterproductive fiscal rule. The Treasury Select Committee's response that it was, and I quote, not convinced that the surplus rule is credible. They're right. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor is locking Britain into an even deeper cycle of low investment, low productivity and low ambition. 
will be making the case for Britain to remain as a positive case within the European Union and all the solidarity that can bring. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, over the past six year, years, the Chancellor has set targets on deficit, on debt, on productivity, on manufacturing and construction, on experts, exports. He's failed in all of them and is failing this country. There are huge opportunities for this country to build on the talent and efforts of everyone. But the Chancellor is more concerned about protecting vested interests. The price of failure is being borne by some of the most vulnerable within our society. The disabled being robbed of up to £150 a week. These aren't the actions of a responsible statesperson or a, they are the actions of a cruel and callous government that sides with the wrong people and punishes the most vulnerable and poorest within our society. He was defeated when he tried to cut, uh, take, make tax credit cuts next month by this House opposing it and by Labour members and crossbenchers in the Lords. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, the continuation of austerity that he's confirmed today, particularly in the area of local government spending, is a political choice, not an economic necessity. It locks us into a continued cycle of economic failure and personal misery. This party, Mr Deputy Speaker, will not stand by while more poverty and inequality blight this country. We will oppose these damaging choices and make the case for an economy in which prosperity is shared by all. Let us harness the optimism, the enthusiasm, the hope, the energy of young people, not, not burden them with debts and unaffordable housing, low wage jobs and zero hours contracts, but instead act in an intergenerational way to give young people the opportunities and the chances they want to build a better, freer, more equal, more content Britain than this, than this chance of the Exchequer has proved he is utterly incapable of doing with his budget today. Yeah.